scary. I see a lot of people struggling with how to manage their money. They aren't keeping track of how much money is coming in and how much is going out. Most kids don't know how to handle money. I'm a big spender, not much of a saver. And I think if I had seen something modeled differently earlier, then I probably would have a different relationship with money. I think World of Money gives them that basis, that financial literacy that they need. World of Money is a youth financial education training institute. It operates Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 4.45 in July of each year. We go in in the morning, we meet with our classroom leader. Each day is different and each day has a theme and focus. So some days we'll be talking about banking, other days we'll be talking about stocks and bonds. I did learn a lot about credit scores, 401ks, gaining interest on money, making your money work for you, how to save your money, checkings accounts and savings accounts. And yeah, how to live a better life. My name is William and Law. Handling money is a big responsibility and it should be held in the hands of a responsible person. Hi, my name is Rachel. I feel like I just graduated from business school, <laughs> like real university business school. Just having role models like that come and share their knowledge with us is one example between, you know, learning, gaining success, and then giving back. And it's just a straight, long sign. Also, one of the cool things that our students learn is Mandarin Chinese. The five tenets of World of Money is learn, earn, save, invest, and donate. <laughs> help me become more aware of how much I'm spending and how much I'm saving and how much I'm giving. It's more about, yes, you had an opportunity to earn the money. Now, what do you do to improve the lives of those that are around you and, you know, the future generations? What you need to give is your resources, whether that's money or your time, and that's more important than anything. No! We have visited the White House uh, about three times. Of our young mogul board of directors joined me as I testified on Capitol Hill to talk to Congress about financial education. Oh. Oh. We've opened or closed the NASDAQ stock exchange four times. We were on CNBC, we have been on MSNBC, we have appeared on ABC, NBC. I feel like financial literacy is one of the key components in life. Um, no matter what career path you choose, you will definitely have to encounter finance, uh, finance or any type of financial uh, components in your life, such as you know whenever you're making a, your first purchase for your home, which was discussed during the, um, the workshops. Yeah. successful. You know, Miss Lamb dreams us to be ambitious and I think that the tools that she gives us at World of Money are helpful in making sure that those ambitions can be sustained. After becoming a billionaire, I will invest my money in charities to build schools worldwide that will teach finance. It's an amazing program. It's done so much more than just teach me about money. It's taught me about being professional, about working hard, about success. It's worth the time and worth the energy and I think that your children one day will thank you for it. Welcome, moguls. Welcome to the World of Money first ever town hall for our online course. We are so excited that you are here with us today. We have an all star lineup for you. We're going to talk some current events. We also have a very special guest on the line that will be joining us here in about 20 minutes. Today, we're gonna have an amazing conversation about real estate, particularly how real estate is being affected during the pandemic. But first, before we hop in, I wanna know who is on the line right now. If you are watching us, let us know in the chat what your name is and where you are calling from so we can give you a shout out. In the meantime, Sienna, you wanna say hi to our mobiles? Yes, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for choosing to be here today from whatever corner of the globe that you're at. I'm so excited that we're able to kick off this journey of financial education and empowerment with you all. Um, this is gonna be a great session about creating a community of global connectivity and, and being able to start this process together. So I'm really excited that we're here together. Um, should we say a little bit about ourselves just to get this kicked off for 
the town hall today, Roman? Sure, I think that's a great idea. First of all, I want to say, hey, Claudia, what's up, NYC? Hey, a lot of people think I'm from New York. I don't know what that means or why, but I'm not. And hey, Sarah from Columbus, is that Ohio? What's up? Well, guys, if you don't know who I am, my name is Roman Murphy. You can call me Money Murphy. I like that nickname. And I am a financial educator. So I focus on helping people overcome their uh, negative habits with money as well as overcome their negative mindsets um, and start building positive habits so that you can build generational wealth and financial freedom. Um, I particularly focus on credit, investing, banking and budgeting and taxes, which are some of the major uh, financial, personal finance topics out there. And we're going to be discussing a lot of that throughout this course and throughout our town halls and um, sessions throughout the week. So whenever you guys have questions, please make sure to either email us, shout us out in the chat, or send us a comment uh, via online. And we're going to be here to answer any questions that you may have. And uh, Sianna, want to tell them a little bit about you? Absolutely. I am a recent college graduate. I went to Barnard College in New York City, where I studied economics. And I'm a lifelong, it feels like, World of Money participant and advocate. I have served as a youth financial education board member for World of Money and been involved for the past 10 years in not only learning and gaining this important knowledge, but also becoming an advocate for financial education for youth and families globally um, since then. So I'm so excited to be here with you today and to get into these really engaging topics and figure out how we can field your questions and um, really have a great discussion today. Hey, Isabella from NYC. I'm so glad that you're here with us today. Welcome again, everybody. Um, we want to start off by introducing you to the idea of real estate and housing. Um, especially during this time of the pandemic, there have been some changes going on. Um, and what we have noticed is that throughout, particularly the United States, I'm very interested to know wherever you're calling from. I know we have some people calling from Africa. I'm very interested to know how housing and real estate are being affected during the pandemic where you are in your community. But particularly in the U.S., we're actually seeing a housing boom while a lot of other industries are being negatively affected by the pandemic, we are seeing a boom in housing, particularly in uh, new home sales as well as previously owned sales. And we're seeing that across our country from the north, south, east, and west. It's been really interesting to see that. Uh, prior to getting into personal finance, I used to teach, um, or I used to work within the travel industry. And the travel industry has been pretty much the biggest industry that's been impacted by the pandemic. And while that travel industry, like I said, is being negatively affected, the housing market is booming. Sianna, do you have any words on that or, you know, why or? Actually, I might even want to take a step back because I have to catch up with you. Really, how would you describe what real estate is? What is that as a concept? Is it like, Okay, I, I mean, I live in a house in the suburbs. Um, I know people live in different areas of the globe, be it in cities, in rural environments. Um, I live in the suburbs. So what is real estate? When we're talking about that, what does that really mean? Well, you hit on a lot of really good buzzwords like suburbs. Um, a lot of people I see on the call are from New York City. That's a major city. So when we're thinking real estate, we're thinking residential as well as commercial real estate. Those are generally two types of real estate. Residential, so um, where people live, their homes, are they living in cities? Um, are you living in the countryside? Or are you living in the suburb region? Um, as well as commercial real estate, so buildings. You know, you, you go around to different businesses and brands and uh, who actually have a physical location and they're inside a building. So all of this is considered real estate. Um, now, people actually have to own those businesses and rent them out, just like people have to rent us or help us buy a home. Um, people 
are actually out there to help us do that. Um, and our special guest, like I said, is involved in real estate. And she's going to get us uh, some really good information later on. But does that answer your question, Sienna? Kind of generally, I didn't want to get too deep. Definitely. I think that helps. Why don't we also take some more shout outs from the chat? Keep telling us where you're from. I'm seeing Poirier from Sudan. Thanks for joining in. I wonder what time it is over there. Um, thank you so much for joining in with us today. Keep telling us where you're from and what sort of things you're observing in your real estate context. So where do you live? Um, what, are, how, what is housing like uh, in your country or in your community? Let us know what is going on with your home. Yes, that's a very good thing to observe. If you're living in a city or on the countryside, wherever you're at, do you see people moving out? Do you see people moving in? Do you see any construction going on in your area? Particularly in the United States, there's a lot of construction going on right now. A lot of people want to build a home in less dense areas, so places where they feel safe from COVID-19. But what do you notice in your area? Think about that. Now, we're about to go to a announcement where we're going to introduce you guys to the World of Money Online course. If you are not currently a student, we're gonna give you a little bit more information about that. So, hope you enjoy. We're gonna play that video to introduce you to the World of Money online course here. And while we're getting that video playing, Claudia, I see that you said NY in NYC in New York City, um, housing costs are usually high no matter what is going on. Yeah, for sure. However, you heard that rent in New York City is, is has been down just a bit. I live in LA, Los Angeles, California, and I've been noticing the same thing. It's ridiculously high no matter what, but they, there have been slight drops, and I particularly have taken advantage of that drop. I actually just moved. Give us one second, guys. Um, Let's take some more questions from the chat. What sort of things do you think impact housing costs and rental costs? Do you think that somebody just comes up with that number out of anywhere? Or what do you think? What sort of factors influence whether the cost of rent is $100 a month, $500 a month, $1,000 a month? And depending on your context, it could be so different. What are all of your thoughts? Let me know. Some things that I take into consideration are definitely knowing the location. Um, so where in the world I am, am I located near a major city where there is major industry or businesses? So that is something that attracts um, a lot of people. And then one thing about real estate is that it's scarce. So when it comes to land, there's only so much to go around. And the more attractive that a city is, the more that people want to live there, the more expensive and more competitive it can be to secure housing in those environments. So that's definitely something that thinks of, that influences the cost of living in these different cities. Um, again, some Jen Beck is sharing that price also depends on the size, quality, and location of the properties that you're looking at. So size definitely matters. Um, getting one acre of land versus 30 acres of land is very, very different. So thinking about the size and then also the quality. So um, what the climate and region is like and whether or not it is um, something that people are attracted to. So do people want to live in tropical environments? Do people want to live in more arid environments or dry? I'm um, thinking about what sort of environmental factors are impacting whether or not um, an environment is appealing to live in. That all influences um, whether or not somebody wants to live there and how much they're willing to pay. Demand is definitely a driving factor 
factor, Claudia. That's exactly why it's so expensive to live in some of our highest populated cities, like New York City, LA, where Roman's calling in from, San Francisco. Um, there are housing crises happening globally that really impact what it means to live in these cities. Um, so what other questions do we have about real estate? Or Roman, are we set with that video? Not set just yet, we're getting there. But I, I was noticing um, in the chat how Claudia was mentioning demand and talking about supply and demand. How do you, uh, speaking specifically about supply and demand, how do you think supply has been affected during the pandemic? Do you think it's been increasing, decreasing? Like, what is that relationship between supply and demand? And actually, if we have a brave soul on the line who wants to kind of take themselves off the mute, play their video, if you want, don't feel pressured. But if you want to explain to the rest of the moguls on the line, because everybody might not be familiar with supply and demand. So if you want to explain to your fe fellow moguls what supply and demand is, that would be awesome. I'll give, I'll give you guys like 10 seconds to decide if you want to share out. If you do, go ahead and unmute yourself and play your video, and we'll be happy to hear from you. Definitely. And if not, feel free to put it in the chat. I will read out your response for everybody because the way that we run our town halls, which maybe we should have set some ground rules, Roman, at the jump was saying that we see you all as our co-hosts and panelists. So whenever we talk about any topic, our desire is to have all of your most candid questions so that we can have a real conversation about what sort of questions are on your mind um, and just the way that you all are engaging critically with this important information. So honestly, we know that there's a lot of intelligence on this call. Um, you're bringing in expertise from all areas of the world where you know your context. So definitely drop it in the chat um, and share out all of the things that you think might be contributing to the real estate dynamics that you're observing in your local context. Thank you guys for being patient with us because we definitely want to get that video to you. If you are not currently a World of Money Online student, we want you to be able to uh, get a better understanding of what you're missing out on and how to join the community if you are interested. Um, Why don't we also take um, from, the, from those of us who have tuned in um, with us on Tuesday and Thursday of this week, on our lessons about the flow of money and money mindsets. What are some of the takeaways that you took from those calls? What is your favorite lesson or something that, um, that was new information to you that you think is important to share with those on the call? I think for me, one thing that helped me understand a lot more about who I am as a participant in the flow of money is knowing that there are four distinct money mindsets that I can be part of as a consumer, as a philanthropist, as an investor um, and producer. All of those things are extremely important in understanding who I am in this space. Oh, here we have another comment on, on housing. Uh, Claudia says that mostly apartments in New York City um, Many are available and, and the interest isn't there due to different circumstances. So pricing goes up and down. Um, if the economy is booming, prices will most likely be higher. Definitely, that makes sense. And I also think it depends on what sort of amenities and services that certain neighborhoods can provide for you. So if you are close to transportation, you have convenience of having restaurants and shops all around you, those are all things that will um, increase the value of your property and your real estate. So you're not, you can take a look and see if you find an apartment or some property in an up and coming area, a developing area where you are making an assumption or an educated guess that more businesses are coming to the area and that it will be it'll become an attractive area to live in. But 
knowing what sort of amenities there are from businesses to the quality of schools, all of those things are things that um, people who are interested in investing in real estate might be considering before they go ahead and make a purchase. That's a great contribution, Claudia. I think it's very interesting, Sianna, how you mentioned amenities, and Claudia agrees with you. Amenities are a plus that attract people, particularly the place that I just moved into. The amenities definitely got me from, I have a media center where I can produce and the quality of my videos are going to be better here in the next couple months. Um, I have a, a another media center where I can watch like a big screen TV and I can actually host events once we can actually host events again. I have an in-home gym, like it's just amazing. So when you're thinking about real estate and, and housing and making any money moves, you have to take in the whole picture. Um, because I read an interesting article recently where uh, it was dealing with housing and, and the pandemic and how some people just instinctively think that moving out of the city at this time is the best move. But that might not necessarily be the case for everybody. Some people might need to still travel. So when you move out of a city, and let's say you work in the city, then you have to factor in travel costs. Remember, we talked about the flow of money this week and how money comes into our wallets as well as how it leaves our wallets. And the goal is to make as much of your money as possible grow. So if you're spending more on different expenses like travel, or another fun fact, groceries tend to be cheaper inside cities in comparison to suburban and rural or country areas. So all of these are factors that you have to keep in mind in order to make the best decision for your particular situation. Now, I know a lot of us on the line, we still live with our parents, with our guardians. So a lot of these topics might not be at the forefront of our minds right now. But sooner rather than later, these are going to be things that you're going to want to think about so that you can make the best decision for you. Um, oftentimes, when we're younger, we have just so much passion and excitement that we just jump and make moves, which is great. You want to be ambitious. You want to be uh, fearless and ready to make whatever move you need to make. But you also want to take, take a step back, look at the whole picture so that you can live your best life. This is all for your benefit. And I am super excited to lead into our conversation with our special guest today. She just joined the line and guys, she is on fire. I know you're going to really enjoy our conversation here. And I'm going to give you a brief introduction. Please, Sianna, stop me if you have any notes or anything to say. Yep. Let me just see if I can share the video on my end through my share screen. We'll take sure. seconds to see if it comes up. And if not, we'll go straight into that bio. There you all. Okay, let me know if you Yep, I can see it. Great, so tune into this video. Do you know anywhere in the world where land is being added onto the planet Earth? I have never heard anyone say, wow, the Earth is growing in size. Hey, I'm JR, and I'm a world of money mogul. Look out of your window. Do you see all of the land and buildings? That is called real estate or property. Real estate plays an important role in the economy of all countries. Residential real estate provides housing for families. It's the greatest source of wealth and savings for many Americans. Real estate is the property, land, building, the air above the land, and underground. It's all real estate. Commercial real estate, which includes apartment buildings, creates jobs, and spaces for retail, offices, and manufacturing. Real estate business and investment 
provide a source of revenue for millions of people. So, we can purchase or invest in real estate. It is important for me and you to learn the types of real estate, the difference between renting and owning real estate, and the pros and cons of renting versus owning. And we should also know what is a lease, a mortgage, equity, real estate investing, and exciting careers in real estate. Remember the world of money motto, learn, earn, save, invest, and donate. I'm JR, see you later. Great, I'm so glad that we were able to get that video. Um, that's just a taste of some of the lessons that you will be getting through the World of Money online course. So if you are interested in real estate, interested in learning a little bit more about what is going on in this space beyond the conversation that we're having, make sure that you register for World of Money online. We're gonna continue this conversation. Back over to you, Roman, with this awesome bio of our next speaker. All right, y'all. I told you she's on fire. Uh oh. Are we getting some feedback there? All right, that sounds better. So, without further ado, I want to introduce our special guest today. Her name is Monica Soyemi. She is an entrepreneur, an investor, and an international singer. She's performed in many cities in the United States, as well as Canada, and has toured internationally in cities in Europe, Asia, and several Latin American countries. This year, Monica will be performing in Tosca at the first ever drive-in opera in the 2020 Phoenicia Festival of The Voice. Most recently, Monica was appointed to serve on the board of the Soharmoniums Women's Choir. She started her business, Mitchell and Soyemi Realty LLC, in 2019, after acquiring her first investment property. Monica values financial literacy and believes in the importance of sharing that knowledge so much that she's been able to amass over 15K subscribers on YouTube, where she shares information on the stimulus package as well as personal finance. She's grateful for this opportunity to share her love of financial literacy and hopes her words inspire us all to get one step closer to financial great greatness. And without further ado, Monica, Welcome. Hey, Monica. Hi, how's it going, everyone? Oh, we are super excited to have you here today. Oh, my gosh. We're going to have a really good conversation. Before we get started, I believe you can tell your story better than I can. So tell the people a little bit about you just really quickly, um, because that was a great bio as well as just kind of where you're at in your journey right now. Okay, awesome. Well, I am a World of Money graduate. I love the World of Money. I'm actually 27 years old and I bought my first rental property at 26. So I am a huge advocate for investing, real estate investing specifically, because I'm actually an opera singer. I've traveled to many countries singing opera. And I realized that when I came back to New York City after doing all of these tours, I was kind of like, hmm, where's my next check coming from? So I decided that real estate investing was what would be best for me. I'm actually doing uh, something called house hacking. And house hacking is essentially when you buy a multi-family property. I currently own a three-family property. You live in one unit and you rent out the other two units. And essentially the bank will give you a mortgage because it is a, it is a personal home loan. It is a primary residence, but you are legally allowed to rent out the other two units for income. And the beauty is my tenants are able to pay my full mortgage plus some. And so I get to live for free and I get to collect money every month and I am building equity in a in an asset. So it's, it's amazing. Oh my goodness, Monica, that is like, that just sounds like the genius plan. And yet I have to wonder how you kind of got there because I don't think anybody just wakes up one day and is like, I'm going to have free housing and this is how I'm going to um, level up in this system. So I'm wondering what 
was your thought process like when you were a world of money student and after you graduated, what sort of things led you to that realization that, yeah, I can not only be a successful business owner and be able to um, gain equity, but I can also have my housing taken care of through this passive income. Honestly, World of Money teaches us all lessons, and that is learn, earn, save, invest, and donate. And I really learned with this book, this book really changed my life, Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. I also read this book, Building Wealth One House at a Time. And I also read this book, the book on rental property investing. So we got the learn part down. Now the earn part was going on tour, singing all over the world, having a W-2 job here, working as a receptionist. I saved a lot of money. I was able to save actually $20,000. It took a lot of sacrifice because I stopped eating out. I stopped going and having drinks with friends. People were like, do you want to come here? I'm like, no, I'm saving. I got a goal. And I was able to save so much money um, by doing so. And then investing is where we are now with investing in real estate. And I do hope to donate um, and give back in a huge way. Like this is a donation, you know, donating my time and just sharing the information that I've learned along the way with you all. Um, but, you know, being a world of money student, and then, you know, we started off with having um, a mutual fund. So when I graduated from worlds of money, I was given a mutual fund. All the people who got in like the top percentile of the class were able to get this huge thing. I'm sure you remember Sienna. And it was so awesome. So I had my, my money growing in my mutual fund. And I was asking myself, you know, I'm still in my 20s. Like, how can I exponentially grow and invest and make more? And that's when I thought of real estate. You know, I, I was thinking of the, the, the amazing thing of being able to collect an automatic paycheck every month. And let me tell you, Sienna and Roman, the moment that I realized that real estate really was for me was when I went on my sister's birthday trip in December. I was in, I was on a cruise, we were all hanging out, and I got a cash app from one of my tenants while I was in the pool. And I said to myself, if I can be making money while I'm on a cruise in the middle of the ocean, then this is what I need to do. Oh my goodness, that is so amazing. Like, I, you are goals, girl, goals, please. I just need you to like sprinkle all of that, all of that just, <laughs> just greatness you got over there on us. Um, thank you so much for sharing all of that and being so open and transparent. Even you mentioned some numbers about how much you had to save and you mentioned the sacrifices that you had to make in order to get to where you are. Um, what, speaking of sacrifices and mindsets, what have you learned about balancing the four money mindsets that we talk about in World of Money? That has been our, our topic, our focus of this week, uh, money mindsets as well as the flow of money. So how money enters our wallets as well as how it leaves our wallets, particularly with the money mindsets, consumer, entrepreneur, investor, and philanthropist. What has been like your journey uh, as far as evolving from one to the other? Did you know about all four money mindsets before world of money and like do you think that one has to occur before the other or is it kind of like your inspiration where you just flow into whatever you know floats your boat well i think the importance of all of the four mindsets is the awareness of it all because i think that's a big part of it that we don't realize you know it's so easy to just go outside and spend 20 bucks on whatever but I think the conscientiousness of, of making those decisions and saying, you know, hey, like I have a goal in mind or hey, this is this is um, the more responsible thing to be doing with my money. Because, you know, when I was in high school, my mom gave me a debit. Well, actually, she didn't give it to me. I just went into Bank of America and applied for a debit card or a credit card. And I was just swiping this card like, you know, subway sandwiches here, whatever. And then one day I realized I swiped the card and it didn't work. And I'm like, mom, are we poor? Like my card's not working. And she, and that's when I had to like sit down. She put me into world of money. She taught me about the importance of, of knowing when your money is coming in and knowing when it's, when it's going out because I had no income, but I had a lot of outcome. And uh, I think that's a very <laughs> important part um, to, to realize and to learn. So, so I think um, 
with with the money mindsets, I think it's just a conscious conscious decision to just be aware of like when you're consuming just to consume to keep up on the Joneses, um, when you are making the the philanthropy mindset choice to to give back and, and what you're gonna you know be doing to do that. And when you talk about money mindsets, I'm also curious, just because, um, just so you know, people on this call are calling in from all corners of the globe and are calling in from so many different contexts. But I think that you have a really powerful and inspiring story, especially as a young woman um, coming from a unique background, Nigerian cultural heritage. I'm wondering how some of those cultural influences in life identities also shaped some of your attitudes about money and how you approached being an entrepreneur in your own right? Yeah, well, that's a great question. Well, honestly, as some of you know now, I am Nigerian. My dad is from Nigeria and my mom is from the Bahamas. So I got the duality of the Caribbean culture along with the Nigerian culture. And as some of you may know, Nigerian fathers are not forgiving. If you got a B, they're like, what is this? What is this B? Where's the A? So there was always this strive for greatness and, and for being better. And I think when I went to Nigeria for the first time, because I was born here in New York City, but I went to Nigeria to visit and I saw the disparity um, in wealth, you know, just driving through the streets and seeing, you know, young people needing money, asking for money, and then seeing like the elite of the elite, like with these houses and pools and drivers. And seeing that really taught me that there's really no lack of resources on the continent. I mean, Nigeria, across the continent, we have so many uh, resources like oil and ideas, and there's really no reason for us to not be able to leverage these things. So I felt like, uh, you know, having that Nigerian father who's saying greatness only, I was like, yeah, we can't, we, mediocrity is not available over here. Um, so that meant that you had to like go for the, the less, um, you know, traditional way of, of, of doing things because I did make $20 an hour and I was making a good salary. And then I realized, how can we make this exponential? So if you want to start off with having a good job, making a great amount of money, saving that money so that, you, so that you can then invest it. You know, when I was able to eliminate my housing expense, I, you know, no longer having to pay rent, that was a huge chunk of change that I could now you know, it's like almost like earning money. Let's say you make like $500 a week and your rent is maybe $1,000 a month. If you're able to buy a home with the money you've saved and you're able to make money every money every month from your tenants, plus now you're making an extra thousand because a thousand you're going to pay in rent, you can now save, you know, it's, it's, it's a snowball effect. So I believe I answered the question. I'm not sure. Yeah, you did definitely, and I love how uh, you mentioned some some points that I think even our parents, our guardians, um, maybe some folks on the line who are older and aren't necessarily in the world of money course some some tips that they can take because I believe a lot of the time, in order to achieve financial greatness, um, it takes some out of the box thinking, mm -hmm. and sometimes just hearing someone else's stories and kind of the things that they went through and the the questions that they ask themselves, it helps us to then look at our situations and say, oh, well, I could kind of do this or rearrange my money like this. And so I'm super thankful that you shared um, those tips with us. Now, you yeah, mentioned- I wanted, to mention, yeah. I wanted to mention one more thing. Actually, um, I know that when I mentioned the number that it cost me to buy this home, uh, two things to take into account first, um, you can get what's called a seller's concession, which is when the seller pays your closing costs. I had a seller who did not want to do those things, which is why I had to come out of pocket a few extra grand. And um, there are also first time home buyer loans where you can put no money down. Now, buying a home with no money down is obviously amazing. You can get into this real estate investing a lot easier. It's less expensive, but you will have a higher interest rate. Now, I also wanted to have a low interest rate. And the interest rate is pretty much what you're paying to borrow this money. You know, let's say your house is $200,000. You can have an interest rate of three, a four, or five, depending on what your credit score is or things like that. So I wanted the lowest 
interest rate possible. So I paid a little bit more to have that. Now, if you are willing to just get in as soon as possible, you can. You would have a slightly higher interest rate, but you would be able to come to the table with less. And the beauty of that too is, you know, your tenants once again are paying all your bills, so it's okay that you know you have that that balance. But um, you know, one thing I've learned as a landlord is always have your phone close by because there's always things going on. Um, but the beauty is, I hope to be able to scale this and then finally have like a property manager and all that. That's awesome. I already know you're going to scale. Like, I don't even know if you know how high you're about to go. Like, you're Thank going. Thank you. Greatness. Once I'm again. receiving um, it. I'm receiving it. Yeah, there we go. Now, a lot of the things that we just talked about can might seem kind of like, yeah. especially to some of the moguls who might not be making their own money yet or mm -hmm. might not be making what they think is enough to save for a property. What advice do you have for young moguls, rising moguls, super moguls? Um, how do they start preparing? If they have listened to your story and they're like, man, that is awesome. I want to be like Monica. How do they start preparing for a career in real estate or a career, if you want to call it that? But what advice would you have for them right now? What are the, those first steps that they can start taking in order to prepare themselves to be property owners? I will definitely say the first and most important step is education. You know, if I had it to do again, you know, one of the questions was, what would you tell your younger self? I would definitely get educated, as educated as I can earlier on, because I just started really getting into it and learning around 25, 26. But if I was 17, 16, I would have read this book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, it really changed my perspective because it teaches you the difference between an asset and a liability. And the difference is an asset puts money into your pocket and the liability takes money out of your pocket. So the reason why your home, this home is an asset is because it is putting money into my pocket every month. Some people think just buying a home is an asset. This is my asset. But if it's taking money out of your month, out of your pocket every month, it's in fact both an asset and a liability because it's taking money out. The way to fix that is get someone else to pay your mortgage. And that makes it an asset. So um, to answer your question about, uh, can you refresh the question? No, you you had already hit upon it. Um, as far okay. as education, what can students do right now who might not yeah. necessarily be making their own money? How can they start preparing themselves? Education. Yeah, yeah. I think education is the biggest thing. You know, reading as much as you can. There is so much uh, online that you can get education from. My biggest help in this whole real estate game has been a company called Bigger Pockets. It's called Bigger Pockets. Everyone write that name down. They have podcasts. I listen to those podcasts on my morning runs. They have YouTube videos about real estate, about investing, about house hacking, which is which I think is the best way to enter into the real estate game. House hacking is the best way because once you go in over into that technical term of investing, you're buying a home that you don't live in, you know, it's solely for investment. Now you have to come out of pocket more. They want 20% of the house down when I only had to put down three and a half percent, you know? Also, you get a higher interest rate when it's an investment. I got a lower interest rate because it's still a primary residence because it's where I live. So it's house hacking here. I, I recommend buying a four family, in fact, getting a first time home buyer, no money down, four family, living in one. Now you can rent out the other three units. As long as it's in a good neighborhood, you're really good to go. I actually have Section 8 tenants. And the reason why I chose Section 8 tenants is because the money comes every month like clockwork. If you have tenants who are paying cash, you know, we're in a pandemic. Some people were not able to pay their rent because they lost their job or they didn't have money. With Section 8, the government's not going to not pay you. So you have Section 8 tenants living in those units, and the government will di direct deposit that money into your account every single month. I that's a strategy that I actually had never considered. So thank you for that tip. Um, with a few minutes left, we want to open the floor to all of our attendees 
with any questions that they might have. Monica definitely dropped some gems of knowledge on all of us. So if there are things that you would like for her to clarify about her process, her story, her journey, wherever she's going, um, this is a great time to get connected with her. Um, right now, Roman is linking Monica's YouTube. She's always dropping gems there too. So if you're enjoying the information that she's sharing with us today, make sure you give her a subscribe and follow on her social media. Um, but take advantage of this opportunity. Put your questions in the chat um, and we'll be able to ask them to her directly with the last few minutes that we have of her time. I believe Isabella has a question. Um, oh, Isabella, I'm so excited that you started saving. Like that's something that a lot of people don't do. A crazy stat, most Americans don't have 400, wouldn't be able to cover a $400 emergency. So if something happened where they needed $400, most Americans, like six out of 10, don't have that money. And for you to be saving and you're 11 years old, you are doing an amazing job. So Monica, Isabella's question is, she started saving, what else can she do? Um, she's obviously a world of money student, so she's educating herself. Um, she's inspired by, by your story. So is there any mentorship out there available for her or what other steps do you have for Isabella? Well, hey, Isabella. Um, you are 11 and you are already killing the game. Honestly, if I could have started at 11, that would have been amazing. So like I said, I would definitely recommend you start off with educating yourself because the education no one can take from you. And I really feel like the way that people are able to get ahead most in this country is because they know things that other people don't know. So if you can start off with getting the knowledge of first off, you know, what is the process for buying a home? You know, it starts off with having the money for, um, of course, the down payment. You're also going to need money for closing costs. You will need things like a realtor, like as you get older. So I would definitely check out uh, the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, read this book. I would also uh, recommend, this is actually not a, huge, a super hard read, um, the book on rental property investing. And I'm actually going to, post two of my YouTube videos in the chat as well. Uh, the, the first video that I just posted there is how to get started in real estate investing. And I made a YouTube video about that. The second video I'm going to post in here is how to invest in 2020. So those two YouTube videos, be sure to go ahead um, onto my channel, check those out because I kind of give like a step-by-step -step on how to really get into this game. Thank you for sharing those, Monica. Do you mind also holding up um, the other two books you mentioned? I put Rich Dad, Poor Dad in the chat. What were the other two? Uh, these were the other two. So the first one, also Bigger Pockets, is the um, you know company that I was talking about. Uh, they have an Instagram, they have a YouTube, they have books as well. I've gotten so much valuable information because this. A uh, company is very first time home buyer friendly. They're very newbie friendly. If you are new to this game, like I still am, they break it down in like basic, basic terms for you to really understand. So this book, the book on rental property investing, it's going to teach you all about strategies to begin implementing. Um, they talk about ways to finance your deals if you don't have the money to, which I didn't. Um, Property taxes is something too important to consider. You know, one thing I didn't realize is you have to consider what are the property taxes wherever you're buying a home. New Jersey has really high property taxes. You might buy a home there and the property taxes are like $15,000 a year versus where I purchased my home, it's $4,000 a year in property taxes. So I'm able to budget that amount into my monthly expenses and I know, okay, like, I can afford this and this is, is, is a good deal for me. So I see we have a question in the chat. Um, hey Q, I don't wanna pronounce your name wrong. Courier, I hope that's how you pronounce it, but Q, I'm gonna call you Q. Q has a question, Monica. Um, mm -hmm. He's a student and he wants to pursue his education abroad. 
and he also wants to travel the world, which you do. So how can he start saving his money for that as a travel hacker, as a travel guru, as well as real estate investor and just overall great person? What advice do you have for Q um, to where he can save his money and prepare himself for a life abroad? Well, that's a great question. Well, uh, two websites that I really find all of my really cheap flights, I'm going to put it in the, in the chat. One of them is called secretflying.com. Secret Flying is a website that I use if I'm trying to find uh, really good flights um, around the country and around the world um, for, for a very good price. I also just go on to Google Flights sometimes. Another one that I use is called Skyscanner. Um, you know, these are these are websites that I use for, for affordable flights, I guess. But um, in terms of preparing yourself for traveling and and maybe studying abroad, I think coming into anything, um, any situation with an open mindset is really the key. I think the more I travel, the more I realize that we're all actually more alike than we realize. And sometimes we're very, we're, we're very, very different, you know? So I think coming into a space with an openness, you know, when I went to um, uh, even Nigeria, I'm Nigerian myself and going to Nigeria for the first time, um, you know, seeing how certain people, how people live. And it was, it was even a shock for me as a Nigerian, you know, or going to places like China or Japan where, where um, just the culture is a lot different. Um, you just have to come with an open mindset and just open to, to the culture. And to add on to that really briefly, I think any sort of savings goal that you all have, um, whether it's to go on a trip or to fund your education, to buy a rental property, it all starts with a plan and figuring out what is something that you can commit to little by little, if it's every day, every week, every month, what amount of money can you set aside um, that will eventually grow into what you need for your goal to, to reach your goal. So make sure that you're really clear about what it is that you're envisioning um, figuring out how much it costs to get there, and then doing the little mental calculation about if I save this much every day, if I save mu this much every month, how long will it take me to get to my goal? And play around with those numbers, get empowered. You have the information, you can absolutely do it. Um, Monica is a great example of taking down what could be a really intimidating process about buying a home at 26, 27 years old and making it work for her. So um, make sure that you take this information forward and apply it to all of your aspirations, be it travel, investment, education, you name it. Um, so thank you so much, Monica. Um, I think we're gonna close out this segment, but I wanna give you a chance to give them some closing thoughts and um, things like that. Yes, of course. So thanks for that, Sienna. And it actually reminded me of one thing, you know, there is no shortage of money in this world. And I really believe it's about being creative and how you make your money. Even with my YouTube channel, I was able to make videos about the stimulus check. And one month, I actually made $3,000 just from making YouTube videos. So there are a million and one ways that you can be making money. One of the ways that I was making money was doing people's taxes, and I was tutoring, then I did some dog walking. Now I have the, you know, tenants paying, and then I realized I have an attic, I can sell storage. So you have to be creative in the ways that you can make money. It doesn't just have to be, you know, from a job, it can, um, a, t a, a normal job, maybe like a nine to five. You can make money so many different ways in 2020. If you have internet, you're good to go. So much for that, Monica. Thank you for sharing your time with us and your knowledge. Um, if you are interested in more about what Monica has shared with us, make sure you again go to her Instagram, go to her YouTube, follow her, the content that she's putting out because she's giving us these this information for free. So we appreciate that transfer of knowledge. Um, the other element of that is that world of money is talking about topics like this in our online courses. So I'm going to take us over to our World of Money online video so that you can get a second taste about what you're getting from the World of Money online experience. Just give me 
15 seconds. And Monica, please put any other information you want to share with uh, panelists or participants in the chat. Any other links? Okay. What if I told you your child could become an educated consumer, investor, entrepreneur, and a philanthropist, all from the comfort of your laptop or mobile phone? And could learn how to manage one of the world's most powerful currencies, money. It's true. I'm Sienna. And I'm Dante. And we are both World of Money Youth Board members. I know firsthand how life-changing it is to be financially capable. When I was 11, my parents enrolled me and my siblings in the World of Money Institute where I learned how to budget, invest, and donate my money. I first attended World of Money when I was 12. And now, like us, over 5,000 young people globally and growing, your child also can become financially educated with the World of Money online course. This award-winning financial education program is tailored for ages 7 through 21. Our course provides 160 self-guided lessons, videos, activities, quizzes, live homeroom, and scheduled town halls. During the course, your child will learn about budgeting and saving, compound interest, artificial intelligence, and so much more. Give your child the foundation for their financial security and generational wealth. Register for the World of Money online course today. Theworldofmoney.org. Developing financially responsible adults. One child at a time. Did I hear somebody clapping? Yes, encore, encore. I also put in the chat, uh, that was a little bit of information about the World of Money online course. World of Money, it's having its fifth annual youth business pitch competition on September 12th, actually. So 9-12, that's a Saturday. If you click that link, it should take you to the Eventbrite uh, where you can actually reserve your ticket. We have a few participants and they would love to have you tune in to listen to their pitches. It's gonna be really awesome. And as far as closing words, uh, Sienna, we will definitely wanna make sure you guys feel free uh, to reach out with any questions, comments or concerns you have about the course or anything related to personal finance that you think we might be able to help you with. Um, Monica left her information in the chat, as well as some resources that she advises that you look into. We also encourage you to make sure that you complete your lessons within the World of Money online course. If you are currently a student, you have 14 days from the release of a lesson to complete it. So please make sure you get those lessons done. What parting words do we want to leave our moguls with today, Sianna? Um, I just want to congratulate you again for logging in from whatever corner of the world you're coming from. We really appreciate you joining our global virtual community of advocates for financial education. You're doing an incredible thing for yourself and for your family. My hope is that you take questions from what you learned today with Monica, what you learned with Roman and I, and ask your families, what are you observing in your real estate context? What sort of real estate choices has your family made? Are they renters, homeowners, land property owners? How does um, land transfer in your households? These are all things that just ask the question and I'm sure people will be happy to give you a great answer. Um, and then you'll be able to be one step closer to being a property owner yourself. Thank you so much for tuning in, everybody. Let's give Monica a round of applause once again. Thank you so much, Monica, for your time and participation today. And that is going to wrap up today's town hall. We'll be back next Saturday, same time, same bat channel, 11 a.m. So feel free to join us then, as well as throughout the week for our homeroom sessions. Remember to learn, earn, save, invest, and donate. I am your homeroom teacher, Roman Murphy. You can call me Money Murphy and Sianna Montero. We will see you guys next time. Signing off.